So welcome to this first segment in MSE 203B, uh, my lectures, David Dyer's lectures on uh, stresses and stress states. Uh, this follows on from uh, the course you've done on tensors in maths um, and on your work in the first year on defining uh, stresses and strains. Um, and this is really where we put that all together and start thinking about stress states in bodies. So we need to first start with some definitions as to what we mean by a stress and a stress state. So if we think about uh, a, a, little, uh, a, a little body, let's think about a little body in 2D actually, it's easier. Um, we'll think about a little elemental cube, um, so, or an elemental square in 2D. Uh, so we'll have some axes, X and Y. Um, and this will have a dimension which is DX and DY. And we'll say it has unit thickness so that we can still preserve areas and so on. Um, and if this body is in equilibrium, if there was only one stress applied, that is a stress normal to those faces, then that stress is a force. Uh, let's call this one P. And for reasons that will become obvious, let's call that one R. Then P and R, they, these both have length dx, notice. Um, so the stress here uh, we'll call is going to be a stress is equal to P over dx. And this stress is R over dx. And those two stresses, let's call them the stress due to P and the stress due to R, have to be equal, i.e. P and R have to be equal, if the body's not moving, if it's in static equilibrium. And we're only considering, in this course, bodies that are in static equilibrium. Okay? We're not considering dynamics, which is another field entirely. Um, so these two have to be equal. And we'll call these two stresses, let's call them a stress on the Y face in the Y direction. So that is, if we have a stress IJ, this is the face that it's on, and this is the direction that it's in. So the face we define by its normal, so the normal vector here is in the y direction, so it's a y, and it's, the stress is in the y direction, so it's a y. So this is a stress y, y, sigma p. And this guy is also a sigma y, y, and they're equal on either side of the body. Now, p doesn't have to be just normal to the face. So we rub this out. Rub this guy out, this guy out. We'll consider another situation where P is like this. And we'll have R being like that. And we can resolve P into a component that's normal to the face, so it's in the y direction, and a component that's in the f along the face, so that is, in this case, it's in the x direction. And R correspondingly would have a component R uh, in the y direction and a component R that's in the y direction. So that's those two there. Um, and similarly we can do the same up here. Now you'll notice we've also got two other faces. So we can also have a force Q. Let's have a force Q and we'll have a force S acting on those two faces. So we've got forces P, Q, R and S. And again we can resolve Q into a component, this one which is normal to the face, that's in the X direction, and a component that's in the face, that is a Q that's in the Y direction. S we can resolve into a component normal to the face, that's in the X direction, and a component along the face, that is in the Y direction. And whatever the force is, whatever the force is acting on the body, we can always do that. We can always resolve them into components normal and perpendicular to the faces. Now, Sx and Qx, if we divide them by the length they're acting on, so they're acting on this length dy, divided by dy times 1, that would then give me a, for a stress, force divided by an area, S uh, sigma, which is in the x direction and on the x face. So it's on the face with its normal in the x direction, 
and it's in the x direction, so that's a sigma xx. And again, it's got to be equal and opposite to this guy divided by the area. So divide that by dy times 1, and that gives me another sigma xx. Um, so we can do that. And I'll just replace this over here for convenience. Do the same with P and R, Y. So we've got a sigma YY and a sigma YY there. Now these guys, these guys are tending to shear the body. They're changing its shape. So this guy happens to be a, over an, uh, an area here which has length DX times 1. So if we divide by DX times 1, um, we've got a uh, stress let's call it tor, and it's on a face with its normal, oops, that's a y, y. It's on a face with its normal that's y, and it's in the x direction, so that's a tor y x. Similarly, this guy, when we divide it by its area, dx times 1, that's also a stress that's acting on a face with its normal that's y, and it's in the x direction. And we could do the same with s and qy, and they would give us tor xy's instead, tor xy's instead. And that guy, tor yx. So now we've turned our, I'll put, just put that there, tor yx. So now we've got a stress state acting on this body in 2D. Now we've talked about the requirement for equilibrium in the x and the y directions. And notice that that also means that these two tor xy's have to be equal and opposite so that equilibrium is still conserved up down, which is why I've written them down with the same symbol. There is another requirement, which is that if we take moments around the centre point, take moments around the centre point, we end up with tor yx is acting on a length dx times a z dimension 1, and it's this different distance, dy by 2, from the centre. So that's the moment acting to rotate the body. Yeah, and we have another moment there, tor x y acting to uh, sorry tor y x there acting to rotate the body in the same sense. So there's two of them. So we multiply that by two, and the twos cancel out. And we've got tor y x dx dy. Counteracting this is this tor x y. So it's tor x y is acting in the opposite direction, and that's also there's two of them. They're along a face of length dy, and they're each dx by 2 away. So we also end up with a dx dy. And if it's not rotating, those sum to 0, the moments. So when well, we've got rid of the 2s and the 1, dx dy cancels now from these two, and tor yx and tor xy must be equal to each other, otherwise you don't get 0. So being in rotational equilibrium also means that these two are equal to each other. Tor xy is equal to tor yx. And the same would be true if we did it in 3D for tor xz and tor zx, and tor, uh, whatever the third one is, uh, yz and zy. So, in order to find the stress state in a body, we only need six stresses. That is, sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz, tor xy, tor xz, uh, and tor yz. We only need those six. And these six stresses define the stress state. That's all there is to it in 3D. Um, and if it's in equilibrium, we only have those. If tor xy and tor yz are not equal and opposite to, to each other, well, sorry, equal to each other, then it won't be in rotational equilibrium and so we're not dealing with a statics problem. So we have six stresses that define a stress state.
And in the literature, there are a number of different notations that people use to describe these. Um, and I just write those down, and they're all equivalent to each other. They all mean the same thing. Another option is you can call these sigmas. So you can call them sigma xy, sigma xz, and sigma yz. And the, and the, sigma X, the normal stress is sigma x, x, y, y, z, z stay the same. So they're equivalent to each other. You can also call the uh, directions 1, 2, and 3, if you like, right? And then you would have sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, and sigma 2, 3. And that would be another way of doing it. So there are three different notations that people use to define stress states. And they're all the same. They all mean the same thing. So don't be worried. And actually, in the course, we'll use them fairly interchangeably because you'll see them in real life interchangeably. So I'm making no apologies about that. That's just the way life works. Um, probably in the end, as we go towards the end of the course, we'll end up all at, in um, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, because I tend to think of them being sigma ij's for reasons that'll be clear as we go through the course. So I become independent of the coordinate system. So we can also define stresses in a different coordinate system. It doesn't have to be a Cartesian coordinate system x, y, z. We can also have another, other coordinate systems like cylindrical polars, spherical polars, curved linear coordinates, whatever you like. Um, so let's just, just think about those for, uh, for a moment. Um, so, so if I have uh, a body in X, Y, Z, then in X, Y, Z, a 3D body like that, if I've got a coordinate system which is Right-handed, get your right hand out. We'll be doing that a lot in the course. First finger, X. Second finger, Y. And third finger, Z. That's our, so Z's out of the board on this picture. Then, uh, on this face, we have a normal stress, which is uh, sigma XX. We have uh, a shear stress acting this way. We'll draw it with a half arrow, actually, a half little arrowhead like that. And that's a stress acting on an X plane and in a Z direction. And this one is a stress acting on an X plane in a Y direction. Then on this face here, we've got a sigma YY. In the plane, we've got one there. That's a sigma Y acting in the x direction and this one's a sigma y acting in the, z in the z direction and here on this face we've got a sigma z z acting out of the page of the board we've got a sigma z acting in the x direction that shear stress and we've got a sigma z acting in the y direction and we've also got ones on the left face, the back face, and the bottom face that correspond. So that's what happens for Cartesian coordinates. If we were in a cylinder, our little element would be a little cylindrical, in cylindrical coordinates, that would be something like this. And it would be then in R theta z. So R is going that way. Theta is going around R theta. And z now is up the page. So you can see with your right hand, r theta z. It's still a right-handed coordinate system. And this direction we quite often call the hoop direction. That's the radial. And that's the z or the axial direction. Um, and there again, we can have a sigma theta theta that's acting, sorry, that's acting uh, on the hoop plane. So it's this plane here, this guy. Uh, let's draw it like this, actually, sigma theta theta. So it's acting on this plane here, this guy. Um, 
and it's ten the, the force that expands a cylinder. Yeah. So that's our hoop stress. And we also have a stress that's acting on the hoop plane. So it's a sigma theta in the axial direction. And we potentially have a stress here that's acting on the hoop plane in the radial direction. Similarly, this is then the axial plane. So we have a sigma zz. But we also have shears sigma z theta and sigma z r. This plane here, well that's the last plane, that's the one with a radial normal. So coming out the other side we'd have a sigma rr, or coming inwards we'd have a sigma rr, that's the radial stress, normal stress. We'd have a, a, a sigma r theta and a sigma rz. So that's defining it in cylindrical coordinates. And you can do the same again for spherical polars. Spherical polars, you have directions uh, r, theta, and phi. So radius, uh, angle around the sphere, phi, angle down the sphere. This angle varies from 0 to 360, that one varies from 0 to 180 degrees, or 0 to 2 pi and 0 to pi. Okay, if you're in radians. And of course, radians make a lot more sense if you're doing calculations. So we can define states of stress for other coordinate systems. You can do it for curved linear coordinate systems, which is why, in general, stress is a 3D object and we talk about sigma ij's. We don't really want to be attached to a, or too wedded to any particular coordinate system. So that's defining stress states for different sorts of bodies. So we can then write these down in a stress matrix or a stress tensor. So, and initially, this will be for convenience, but what we'll see is as we go through the course that actually writing it down in this way and treating them as a tensor means that a lot of the mathematics becomes very straightforward. So what we do is we write them down in the following way. Write down sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz as the elements on a leading diagonal of a 3 by 3 matrix. Um, and we write down then sigma xy here, sigma xz. So these, this row is the x plane. This one would be sigma yx, this one would be sigma yz, and this one would be sigma uh, zx, and this one would be sigma uh, zy. So the columns are the directions in which the stress is acting. Remembering sigma ij, i is the plane, j is the direction. Now the requirement we said before where sigma x, y and sigma y, x had to be equal means that this matrix is quite a special matrix. It means that this, these two elements are equal, so we can just write them down as that being sigma x, y. These two elements are equal, so we can just write that down as sigma being y, z. And these two, x, uh, z, x, x, z, that should be, these two are equal. So this matrix is what's called um, a symmetric matrix. That is, it's symmetric about the leading diagonal. So it's a symmetric matrix or tensor, because it's in fact a tensor. So these are symmetric. And it's symmetric because we are at equilibrium. both transla translational equilibrium and rotational equilibrium. And we're at equilibrium because the body is static. It's not moving. So this is a symmetric tensor. And that's how we define a stress state. So having done that, let's move on
and think of a couple of examples. Think of a couple of examples and fill in what the stress tensor is for those examples. So, simplest example we can think of is a body that's under a single stress acting on its normal. So we'll have a body, uh, let's call it a rod for the sake of argument. There's a rod. We'll define this uh, as the one direction, I don't know, two direction, three direction. One, two, yeah. three. Two's into the page. Three is up. So three is Z if you like. Two is Y, one is X. If we have a stress acting on that, so that's a stress one, one, stress one, one, or stress X, X if you like. There's only one stress acting on the body. So then we have a value sigma XX, or sigma one, one, and all the other values in the stress tensor are zero. So if I had asked you prior to this point what was the stress on the body, you'd have given me a single number, sigma one, one. If I asked you for the stress state now, you would write down a stress tensor with all of its elements being zero apart from the first element in the 1, 1 position. If we had that stress acting in the 2 direction on the 2 plane, you would write it down there instead. If it was in the 3 direction on the 3 plane, you'd write it there, so on. So that's the simplest example, and that's called uniaxial tension. And that's what we do in a tensile test. Um, so this is uh, what happens in a tension tensile test. Now, you'll notice where we write it in the stress matrix, or in the stress tensor, depends upon the axes we picked. If I move the axes around, I could write it down and put the stress there or the stress there. Doesn't matter. Yeah? And the other thing to notice is that I have defined, I have to now define, that sigma 1, 1 is greater than zero for a tensile stress and less than zero for a compressive stress. So the normal stress, sigma 1, 1, is greater than naught, or sigma i, i, if it's a general normal stress, for tension. And if it's less than naught, you have compression. So if I compress this cylinder, then I would quote the stress as being the negative force divided by the area. So if I compressed it, put a force on it of 100 newtons over an area of 1 meter squared, um, I would have a stress of 100, uh, let's call it a millimeter squared, 100 divided by 10 to the minus 6, so it would be 100 megapascals. And I would call that a stress of minus 100 megapascals, because the minus would be denoting that it was compression. And that's all the minus sign is. Now, the next example we'll think about is that of hydrostatic compression. This is a slightly special one. So this is what happens to a little block. It's an infinitesimal block that has the same force acting on all of its identical sized sides. So it has a stress here, sigma, acting on all six of its normal faces and no shears. And that is called a hydrostatic compression. That's what happens under the sea. So here's the sea. There's my block under the sea. You know it's the sea because there's a little shark fin uh, at the surface. Um, and there it is under the sea quite happily. And of course if it's a solid block, what, what's the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't, this sort of stress will change the size of the body, but it won't change its shape. Um, so this is called hydrostatic compression. And in this case, we put the stress in, it's the same stress on all of the normal faces. So we have a sigma there, and all the others are zero. And that's a state of hydrostatic compression. Um, and this sort of stress state, it notice it doesn't matter how we define the x, y, and z axes, however we put them, 
we get the same stress state. So this stress state is what's called invariant to rotations. Um, so if you like, it's an isotropic, iso the same everywhere we look, stress tensor. So that's the second type of stress state that we can consider is that of hydrostatic compression. And the third type of stress state we can consider is another interesting one, which is that of pure shear. So this is where we've got a little body. There again is our little body. And it just has one stress on it, which is a shear stress. And that's a shear stress there. And that's got to be the same shear stress everywhere because it's in static equilibrium. Um, and that's a stress state like this. If we've defined that to be x, that to be y, and then the outward normal here is z. So this appears to be simple. Um, we've chosen the axes to coincide with the stress state symmetry. But if we had moved the axes around by 45 degrees, it might be a bit different. And that's one of the things we're going to explore. So it would appear as a more complex stress tensor if we had axes that were in, different, in a different way. Not 90 degree rotations, but funny rotations, 45 degrees, 30 degrees, some other angle. So the other thing we need to think about with shear stresses is whether this is a positive shear stress or a negative shear stress. And it depends on the sense of the axes. So according to Dieter, then a shear stress is negative if it points in the negative direction of a positive face of a unit cube. So this shear stress is uh, on the positive side of the Y face and it's pointing in the positive x direction. And therefore, uh, it's a positive shear stress. If it was pointing the other way, it would be a negative shear stress. So this is a positive shear stress if it was the other way around. So that's positive. If it was the other way around, that is, tor yx was like that, it would be, and the other guys all matched, then it would be negative, and we'd have to put minus signs in there. And that's just the sense of the convention. Um, so there's a little bit of thinking to do there uh, about negative and positive shear stresses. But by and large, we'll deal with positive shear stresses because it will just, it's just awkward otherwise, and it's only a minus sign. Right? And we've, what's one of the things we need to think about as we go further and further in the degree, you need to be a little bit relaxed about the minus signs. Um, not worry too much about them. But that's a positive shear stress drawn in that sense. So in this segment, what we've looked at is we've looked at defining stress states. We've defined them for right-handed and locally orthogonal coordinate systems. So we can have cylindrical coordinate systems or curvilinear linear as long as they're locally orthogonal. Um, and if we change the coordinate systems, we're not changing the stress state. We change the way we write down the stress tensor. So the stress state, the body itself, doesn't care how we define the axes. But how we define the axes will change the stresses, the numbers we write down in the stress tensor. So uh, the difference in coordinate systems is purely to change the values, but not the state. And that's an interesting observation. That's going to be one of the things that's going to be key to this. Um, um, what we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to look at how we rotate the axes and what that does to the values in the stress tensor. Um, and that will lead us to some startling observations. So we can always, this is the only thing we're going to find out, rotate to a set of axes where the shear stresses are all zero. Um, and that implies that there's some relationship between the normal and the shear stresses, which impli is implied by stress being a tensor. And that's uh, why we've waited to do this until you've done all the tensor work uh, in 201, 
in the first term of the second year. Now the other thing is, you might wonder, well I've just spent however long, 15-20 minutes, talking about just defining stress states. And why do we care so much? Well, and why are we taking so much care over this? Well, in other departments, say in uh, red brick universities, in mechanical engineering departments for instance that I know well, they don't do stress as a tensor. They're always a bit floppy about it because they don't think that the students can handle the maths. Now we know that you guys can handle the maths, so we're going to do it properly, and that means you're going to be able to think about stresses properly um, in materials and how they relate and how they operate in different directions, and that will make you uh, able to uh, appreciate a lot of ideas about elasticity and about crystals and about uh, crystalline materials um, and about things like pizza electricity much more much better because you've done the maths and you've done, done this quite carefully. So this will be a rewarding study in this set of lectures. And I'll see you for the next segment.